So we understand that not all wars and conflicts receive the same media attention. We have examples of Yemen, uh, Ethiopia, Palestine, and most recently, um, Afghanistan last year. However, the Western media coverage of a very well-predicted Russian invasion of Ukraine has specifically received criticism for having double standards. Do you think that is the case? And if so, what makes this war more worthy of a regular and longer periods of coverage than other cases? I think there's a great many issues bound up in the Ukraine crisis at the moment. Um, really, um, we're looking at unresolved issues from the end of the Cold War, in a sense. Um, a strategic question might very well be, how come Russia is still the enemy? Of course, um, after the 1917 revolution, there was a ready-made answer to that question because it was a communist country apparently bent on the destruction of capitalism. And then there was the uh, seeming anomaly that um, only by allying with the Soviet Union um, were the Western powers, the UK and the United States, able to end up on the winning side in World War II. Um, but then we had the Cold War period. And at the end of that, I think we, and I mean we collectively as a world community, really missed the opportunity to transform uh, the conflict with the former Soviet countries, um, chiefly Russia, of course, um, opportunities were missed both in the economic sphere and the strategic security sphere. Um, in the economic sphere, the so-called grand bargain to bring about the thoroughgoing reform of the Soviet economy um, with a, a plan analogous to the post-World War II Marshall Plan was rejected by the G7 countries. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, it wasn't until mid-90s that the first money from the IMF arrived in the former Soviet space. Um, and in the security sphere, the ideas championed by the likes of François Mitterrand for a pan-European security architecture based on the Conference for Security Cooperation in Europe uh, also effectively came to nothing because NATO continued its existence. Now, in that post-Cold War space, NATO has changed. Um, at the time of the Kosovo crisis in 1999, NATO uh, changed its rules so that it could act as NATO on territory other than the territory of a member state. Um, so it switched from being a purely defensive alliance to one with an offensive capability. And of course, looked at from the outside, uh, from a Russian point of view, you ask yourself, well, you know, who is that pointed at, actually? Why should there continue to be a NATO? Even after that, there were at least semi-serious overtures from the Russians to be accepted as NATO members, but of course they were never encouraged. So we remained frozen in that dyadic conflict structure. Now, what is at stake really in the media coverage is not necessarily to go into that whole history, but to prompt and enable audiences to develop what I would regard as a critical understanding of what's going on. And by critical, what I mean is that the reality that we see uh, being played out in Ukraine now it is a layered reality. Mm -hmm. And there are different relations of cause and effect that arguably flow in different directions on different layers. So yes, on the surface presenting layer, there has been a massive infraction of international law, and by the way, international humanitarian law by Russia in and against Ukraine. But on other layers, there have been flows of cause and effect that have gone the other way, whereby the Russia we meet today is part of a reality around us, which is partly of our own making. It is our own actions and our own omissions, as in the case of the Palestinians that you mentioned, which have weakened international law as an analytical factor um, and the constraint on the behavior of state actors in conflict. Um, it is um, our joint and shared failures to imagine, conceive, and create a shared security architecture for Europe that has left available this narrative to uh, Vladimir Putin and his leadership of Russia, um, that Russia has been frozen out, victimized, placed on the outer, is under threat, and so forth. Uh, that narrative should, should have been removed from the equation um, by a much more imaginative response to the end of the Cold War to um, do away with the dyad in Europe 
heal the divisions in Europe, yes. uh, instead of which everybody was left frozen in these two great blocks. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned about a narrative and then you uh, talked about um, the transformation of narrative as well. Um, if you look at the recent history, um, specifically from, um, from the perspective of how media have covered it across the world, and um, so never before or never in the recent times, we have uh, witnessed something that we're witnessing now, a common narrative service surfacing across major outlets that have been referring to this invasion as, quote unquote, not our usual war, or people who are not used to war, or even these civilized people versus um, implying uncivilized, um, et cetera, et cetera. So how and how much do you think such narrative hurts journalism that is based on conflicts, on a conflict sensitive approach? Well, I, I think I, I, um, I think that's a very important point. I mean, I endorse the statement put out by the um, um, Association of, um, I think it's the Association of um, uh, Arab and Middle East journalists in the United States, um, which complains that um, some of the coverage has reproduced what they regard as a, an Orientalist narrative mm. um, and has constructed non-Western spaces as ones where we should expect mayhem and violence and infractions of international law um, to be the norm. Mm -hmm. So therefore in the phenomenology, we should be more surprised when those things crop up uh, and affect Europeans uh, than when they affect non-Europeans. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely a, um, a strong tinge of that. You noted that the Western coverage of U Ukrainian invasion has contributed to the pre-existent dehumanization of non-white or non-European people in media framing of um, not only in this context, but generally of war and conflict, um, which as you mentioned, is not very common uh, to, to, to be experienced in um, traditionally white um, regions. Now, social media users were quick to point it out, um, but why do you think has the debate on fixing these structural issues um, on a structural level, they have faded away very quickly. Within a few days, no one's talking about this anymore. We moved on. <laughs> I, I do think, um, to, to my way of thinking, Australia, in, in, we're, we're having this debate in Australia, Australia to me seems to be slightly anomalous in the sense that the political economy of news media in Australia is still um, very, um, uh, commercially and corporately dominated. Um, and there is apparently rather little space for um, sustained serious initiatives in news journalism, um, which are not um, commercial or corporate. Now, um, that doesn't mean there are not um, non-commercial media initiatives, there are. So for example, one of the very good ones um, Pearls and Irritations. Pearls and Irritations is a, a, a near daily digest. It's a very impressive achievement, but it, it's a digest of commentary by experienced commentators on the news. Mm -hmm. And that's a bit different than the activity which is being carried out by, for example, ProPublica um, in the United States or um, Open Democracy in the United Kingdom or you know, large numbers of examples in, in other European countries. We don't really seem to have many, if any, of those kinds of initiatives here in Australia. So there are correspondingly fewer media spaces whose stock in trade is to seek out otherwise marginal and repressed voices as mm -hmm. the sources. Most news about public affairs is in Australia, for that reason, is in Australia still dominated uh, by uh, official sources. And so therefore we're still in the um, phase um, set out in scholarship by, for example, um, W. Lance Bennett's indexing model, where the extent of disagreement reflected in most news reporting corresponds to the extent of discordance between senior front bench spokespersons for the political parties that are contesting government. Mm. And, and that ain't a very big difference in Australia. In fact, there are, there are good reasons why um, that's not a very big difference because of the um, structure of um, Australian electoral politics, 
Um, the opposition Labour Party at the moment, for example, has every incentive to present um, a small target on issues um, where they would not necessarily choose to open a debate. Yeah. Um, so you're not going to catch Anthony Albanese or any of his lieutenants allowing a cigarette paper to be inserted between their position on something like the Ukraine invasion and that of the coalition. Yeah. Um, so, so that then is then reflected in the media coverage as well. So it, it does seem as though, you know, Australian news about such affairs is often sort of, um, you know, shuttling between the angels that can be fitted onto the head of a pin. Uh, whereas there is a more diverse and, dare I say, arguably more lively and more stimulating media economy uh, in other uh, domains such as the UK and the United States. That's yeah. what we're missing. Yeah. Um, you mentioned about targets uh, and uh, political um, priorities given to certain debates in, you know, in the national narrative. Whether targets are small or big, um, media ethics is very important, right? So no matter how much time media organizations invest in media ethics trainings or sensitization of journalists towards such um, 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 such issues, such, such sensitive issues, it seems that um, most journalists just leave the ethical code back home when they're covering war or conflict, even from a distant, like um, um, from a distance, like in this case. Now, this has been specifically noted in the coverage of the present Russian um, invasion of Ukraine. Do even do ethics even matter to journalists when they're covering conflict? We, we have the benefit um, provided to us by Thomas Hanich and colleagues a few years ago of a, a compendious mm -hmm. um, worldwide study, um, the Worlds of Journalism Project, which administered the same or similar questionnaires to um, journalists in, I think, as many as 60 countries. So it's a very comprehensive study. And one of the key domains of those um, responses was about journalists' ethical ideology, as the uh, researchers put it. And the single most widely shared precept among all these journalists across the world was non-involvement in or detachment from the stories on which they are reporting. Mm. Now, that embodies um, a certain kind of journalistic ethic, uh, which we could call a deontological ethic or an ethic of duty. It can be glimpsed in the phrase attributed to um, Alfred S. Ox, who founded the New York Times, that the newspaper should report without fear or favour. Mm -hmm. And it is uh, deliberately choosing not to take account of the possible consequences of the reporting on the subsequent course of events. Mm. Now, there is therefore a, an alternative, in some cases complementary journalistic ethic that one could char characterize as a teleological ethic or an ethic of consequences, which does take account of those ramifications. Uh, and um, I have argued in the past that really, um, the prevalence of the deontological ethic can be attributed partly to the kind of masking effect um, of um, uh, media effects. So um, where media effects are somehow masked or um, they are not uh, literal or they are extra linear um, or they are um, concealed or occluded in some way, then it is easy to ignore those consequences. But my argument is that in today's mediascapes, um, the um, uh, causes and effects are so clearly uh, linked and come around so fast that it's becoming more and more difficult to sustain this deontological ethic. Mm -hmm. And one of the gathering points for this argument came with the um, White House podium address by President Trump immediately following the federal election in the United States in November 2020, and he he used that podium address to set this hair running about a stolen election, uh, and he was appealing to his supporters for funds, which he went on to do, ostensibly to fight legal battles in courts across uh, the, uh, the United States uh, to try to overturn these results, none of which succeeded because none of them had any foundation whatsoever. Um, but really what he was doing was, was getting this money to kind of um, uh, breathe new life into his own political campaigning. Um, and um, 
he was very consciously using this set piece event in the knowledge that the um, very firmly established convention of reporting was that all the major US television networks would carry his podium address live. So mm -hmm. an opportunity to get unfiltered uh, and uncommentated and unopposed versions of events out there into the public domain. Now, the um, US Nets by this stage were obviously they've been around this block a few times with Mr. Trump. Uh, they, they didn't come down with the morning dew. They realized they were in the process of being used. So they unprecedentedly switched away from his podium address mm -hmm. in the case of MSNBC after I think only about 35 seconds. Um, uh, so therefore, the, the um, pretense that um, one tries to maintain that one can just report without fear or favor um, without thinking about the consequences of one's reporting it, it is no longer available because one is palpably embroiled in the loops and coils of political conflict, whether one likes it, seeks it or not. And that I think is an increasingly frequent and increasingly palpable, increasingly obvious uh, set of conditions um, in which journalism is operating in today's extended media spaces. Uh, and therefore, correspondingly, the deontological ethic is becoming harder to sustain. And this is why in new media, in media that uh, are doing journalism that is not um, sustaining itself through market mechanisms, you are seeing a more and more open embrace of a teleological ethic. Mm -hmm. You know, journalism is, is evolving away, in some cases evolving away from being a commodity to be bought and sold, and evolving in a sense more towards a good cause to be supported. So these media are appealing for donor funds, uh, grant funding, foundation funding, subscriber funding, supporter funding, mm -hmm. and the basis on which they are making those appeals usually contains some kind of narrative about the effect they are seeking to bring about. So in a sense, we're, we're seeing the one ethic being uh, supplemented by uh, the other ethic in a growing edge of mm -hmm. journalism in these media. Um, as I say, chiefly represented elsewhere than in Australia, sadly. Yeah, and uh, I think this uh, highly mediatized society uh, and, and complex uh, media ecology, I think, because of social media platforms as well, has really added to that uh, notion, um, which reminds me, uh, um, you know, just generally skimming through the daily coverage of the invasion uh, of Ukraine. Um, uh, in just a few media publications, I've noted the glorification of armed resistance, including um, uh, on social media, such as TikTok and Instagram. And there are open appeals for online donations to military without any government backlash or any um, suspension of these accounts or even any regulation from, um, from one of the stakeholders, which makes me think, is no one talking about peace? Is no one, because there's propaganda, there's censorship, and there's misinformation. And, and these are the main ingredients for conflict escalatory journalism. So how do you think can journalists overcome these hurdles in the times of war and conflict when when war and is being fought at different levels in there's an economic war there's there's war being fought on social media there's also um, of course the on on ground so how can peace journalists navigate through so much complexity well um i think um you know um I, I, i'm speaking to you as a as a peace professor of course i'm sort of part of the peace movement um it, it's up to people like me um, to start talking about um, what we do want. You know, no, nobody wants war. We don't want war. So what do we want? What do we want to come out of this? Um, how's it going to end? Um, it, it can only end by um, some form of agreement, eventually. Mm. Might take a long time. Uh, but what is that agreement likely to, to be? You know, what's it going to look like? Um, and then once we've decided that, we need to start um, ventilating those analyses by... Um, offering um, articles to the likes of Australian Outlook and the ABC and the Conversation and the newspapers to try to get that kind of discourse going. Um, and then um, trying to engage with journalists and saying, look, we, we can be sources. You know, if, you, if you've done, you know, sort of 30 consecutive days of this is what the Prime Minister says about Ukraine, why not on day 31 at the very end of the month have this is what someone in the peace camp says about Ukraine? Um, and try and do it like that. There's, there's no shortcuts to it, I think. But um, what um, peace journalism really um, uh, indicates, I think, 
it is that preparedness to reach out beyond the official sources to uh, try to look through the kind of hardened carapace of demands and positions being put forward by um, leaders of parties to identify and discuss the needs and interests that nestle within them. Uh, and that's where people such as myself, you know, people who can interpret those kinds of dynamics from within the peace camp need to engage actively with media uh, and through media. So that's what we try to do. Yeah. On a note that media coverage and how media frame certain issues definitely affects the, the response that 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 issue or an event gets from people around the world. Thank you so much.